Any elders in attendance, please stick around after the services for a short meeting. And also, um, if you notice up here, we have some some foodstuffs that are going to the Man Food Bank. Uh, we let our food dry, and so if you don't have a bag up in the Orthex, you can uh, grab a bag or two, fill them up, and bring them in. We'll have a blessing for those uh, foodstuffs we take over to the Man Food Bank next week. Uh, are there any announcements on the floor? Then let's continue. Our call of worship today comes from Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God, okay, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord.
We sometimes look around us and can't believe that all hungry people can be fed. We don't always trust your promise to provide. We don't jump to help when you seek to perform miracles still each and every day of our lives. Sometimes our greatest sin, Lord, is lack of faith. Lack of faith in your promises. We make excuses for our sins, and yes, if we're honest with ourselves, we deny our complicity. Forgive us, holy God, and free us to serve you, and not the will of Satan and his minions. Let us now keep short accounts with you as we confess our sins in the silence of our hearts.
that the Lord does listen to his people pray, and I do believe he sent the Spirit to this place, and I do believe that our choir needs a round of applause. <laughs> Come to that time in our worship now where we have the reading and hearing of God's Word. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 11. I'll be reading verses 1 through 15. By way of background, I think we followed a little bit over the last month the life of David. David, of course, was plucked from tending his father Jesse's sheep. He was anointed by the prophet Samuel to be the, the future king of Israel. He fights with King Saul in the battle. He's victorious over, over Goliath. Saul dies. David becomes king. And he's leading his people into victory after victory. But then we have a problem in the reign of David's life. There's the old saying that idle hands are the playthings of the devil. And this is truly the case here because I struggle with this passage of scripture because what I'm about to read to you somehow contradicts what, what the Bible tells us that David was a man after God's own heart. But then when I see my own life, each and every one of us are just one step away from temptation and fall. And so yes, idle hands can make playthings of all of us, if you will. David is back in the palace, lolling around, enjoying life, while his military commander, Joab, is out there leading the troops in the battle. And then temptation knocks at David's door. I don't blame Bathsheba here. Quite honestly, I don't think God, in my personal opinion, has ever made uh, a woman not beautiful. I believe all women are beautiful in, in, in the creation that God made them. So we can't blame Bathsheba here with this. This is simply an immoral lapse in David's judgment, where he becomes guilty not only of adultery, but also complicity and conspiracy and murder. Hear now the word of the Lord, 2 Samuel chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. In the spring of the year, the time when the kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked Joab and the people how the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out to the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance to his house, and with all the servants of his lord, he did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, You have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I go down to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today, and tomorrow I will send you back. So, David remained in, so Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the service of the Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, 
set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. Continuing our reading, we read from our gospel lesson today, the story, of course, in John's gospel now, about Jesus and his continuing Galilean ministry. Jesus has just had a very busy day of healing the sick, and now he's taking me looking for a little bit of rest. However, the people's needs are such that Jesus really could never find that rest that he looked forward to. So we hear this story here, this very famous story, the feeding of the 5,000. Once again, hear now the word of the Lord. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up to the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in that place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this indeed is the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because of a strong wind was blowing. When they rode about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him in the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward that which they were going. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And may God add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his, his holy word. Please join me in a prayer for your illumination. God, you are merciful through your word. Open to us your spirit's presence. Humble us with your listening. Soften our uncertainty and stubborn wills so that we might hear and receive this message you in turn intend for us today, Lord. We pray, Lord, that in all we may not be just hearers of the word, but also may be doers of the word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we come now to one of the most familiar stories in all of the Gospels. Jesus' miraculous feeding of the 5,000. Part of that familiarity can probably be attributed to the fact that this, this story is the only story that's recounted in all four Gospels. All four of them. The only other story recorded in all four Gospels is the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But all four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record this miracle here, the feeding of the 5,000. And so it sort of makes us take, sit up and take notice that when, when all gospel writers recount the life of the ministry of Jesus, Jesus here, they are trying to make a very important point. And the important point of that is, is that this miracle, the feeding of the 5,000, is an important teaching, not only for his disciples then, but to us, his disciples, 2,000 years since then, it is the title of this sermon that I have this morning, You Give Them Something to Eat. It's recorded in Matthew 14, Mark 6, Luke 9, and of course right here in John 6 that we just read. 
The story, however, is simply memorable in its own right. As a child learning this in Sunday school, I sat back and began to wonder, how did he do that? Come on now. You know, I can add, and I'm thinking, okay, and I, and I, I, I know 5,000 is a big number, but somehow I couldn't wrap my little mind around the fact that it was a miracle. Jesus blessed these elements and he distributed them to the people. It doesn't tell us the specifics, but the context tells us very clearly that there were the disciples with him. Okay, And this teaching, this miracle, is not only for the disciples, but also for the people. John notes that it's, this area is taking place around the Sea of Tiberias. Whenever we talk about the Sea of Tiberias, we're also talking about the Sea of Galilee. It's also known as uh, the Sea of Gennesaret. But it's called the Sea of Tiberias here, and that's because um, Herod the Great's son, Herod Antipas, founded a city there, and he named that city, he named that city Tiberias. He named it to get in the good graces of the Emperor Tiberius, the Emperor of Rome, who was the emperor at that time from uh, 14 AD to um, 37 AD, the emperor during this period of time in the life of Jesus' ministry. So the nearby Sea of Galilee soon became called the Sea of Tiberias, and there was a prominent city on the shore. So we know the location of where this is taking place. And telling this, this story here, it's interesting that uh, the feeding of the 5,000 is, uh, as I said, recanted in all these other Gospels. But telling the story itself does not really help explain it. Because Jesus goes on later, as we'll consider in the next two weeks, to not only talking about feeding people, but how Jesus himself is what is known as the bread of life. And we'll be reading those two accounts the next two weeks in, in John's Gospel, where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. It's one of the seven I am sayings that Jesus has in the Bible. It's the very first of those in John's Gospel. You may have heard them before. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the vine. You are the branches. He goes here to say, I am the bread of life. But that's a story for another day. Jesus here travels to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and he decides he needs some rest after this day of healing. But what does he see? He sees a crowd coming. And the text said, because they saw the signs and wonders that he did. They didn't follow him because he was the son of God. No, they followed him because of these miracles here. This was a great show. And they flocked to see his works, but they refused to accept. They refused to accept his words. So when Jesus goes up the mountain and sits down with his disciples, he's probably thinking a well day's rest is about to come. But such is not the case. So what does Jesus do? He immediately adapts to the situation. And where do we have here Philip? Philip answers an honest question. Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? The text said he says this to test him, where Jesus knew what he was about to do, what he was about to do. Now, Philip may have been the treasurer of the group, and Philip was probably the guy, you know, crunching the numbers. And he was saying, yeah, now wait a minute now, 200 denarii worth of bread will not be enough to give these people to eat. Now, 200 denarii is 200, 200 days wages. A denarius was, was, was paid, it was one day's wage in the ancient world, the ancient Roman world. So we're talking here, he says 200. He's talking about basically what a person would earn working 200 days of their life, one person. And even that wouldn't be able to feed all these people. So the denarius, as I said, was a day's wages. Well, while Philip counted the cash, okay, hmm, all right, Andrew counted the goods. And he finds this boy with five barley loaves and two fish. But like Philip, Andrew concluded they were far short of what was necessary. He says to the fishes of the fishes of the what are they among so many? So a desperate situation is brewing here. How are you going to feed 5,000 people? And it's late in the day, too. If there are markets nearby, they're closed. And of course, where's the money going to come from to feed these people that have followed Jesus? This is the fourth miracle that's recounted in John's Gospel. The fourth miracle. First miracle, of course, was Jesus turning water into wine at the wedding feast of Canaan. The second miracle, of course, was the healing of the woman who had touched his clothing. The third, of course, was the healing of, of the synagogue leader's daughter, Jairus. And now we come to this present miracle here, the fishes and the loaves. And the desperation was the fact, as I said, that it's late in the day. Where are they going to find this food? 
Now certainly there's a parallel in John's Gospel with the book of Exodus, where the people, the Hebrew people, while they're in the desert during their 40 years of wandering, they are grumbling too, and they say, what are we to eat? And what does God do? Well, we know God provides manna. He provides that wafer from heaven that provides them seven days worth of food that they eat during that 40 year journey in the wilderness. But as God provided manna for those following Moses, now Jesus is simply saying, have the people sit down. Have them sit down. Now John tells us there was much grass in that place. That's significant because it highlights the fact that he said this was the time of Passover. And Passover always happens in the spring of the year. So we can take John's account here that obviously the grass is not withered through the sun. The people are sitting there. They're about to have a picnic, if you will. The crowd's about 5,000. That's what the text says. There were about 5,000 men in the crowd. But let's do the math here if you think about it, okay? There were more than 5,000 people there. Some commentators guess that there may have been as many as 20 or 25,000 men. Not five because there were women and children also. I suppose the minimum men would be at least somewhere between 15 or 20,000 people in that crowd. So that's how big this crowd is. That even makes the miracle even greater if you think about it, not 5,000, but probably 15 or 20,000. So I was trying to do the math here, you know, and think of this through and to give it some kind of contextual balance. And I think about, for instance, uh, Admiral Fetterman Field over where the Blue Wahoos play. Okay, that ball yard seats 5,000 people. Okay, 5,000. If everyone, if all everyone in the stands are filled. But that's not enough. So then I went to the Pensacola Bay Center and they see 12,000. So I'm trying to do the math there. So even if I put 5,000 and 12,000 together, I've only got 17,000. And I sometimes bother my mind, we're talking about 3,000 more than that possibly. Now, as for the miracle himself, he takes the loaves, he distributes it. But he, first off, he gives thanks. He gives a blessing for the food that people are about to see, receive. And as a result of that blessing, the loaves and the fish are multiplied. Jesus simply performed a miracle. And that's what the text calls it. He calls it a sign. And the sign so impressed people that those thought, wow, this is a prophet. And they set their sights on making him king. So Jesus had to take a withdrawal. And when they speak of the prophet, the prophet, they had in mind the prophet that Moses wrote about in Deuteronomy, where he said, I will raise up for you one day a great prophet who will be your king. The Lord will raise up for you, and you shall listen to him. That's a foreshadowing in the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament of our Lord Jesus Christ coming. So Jesus surely was his prophet, and yes, he was a king also. He was the king of kings. The only problem was, is that his kingdom is not of this world. People back then confused it. They thought they could take and make him king. He would throw off the Roman yoke of oppression, and consequently, consequently, they would be free. That's not the kind of king Jesus came to be. Christ's kingdom is not of this world. They wanted someone to deliver them from Romans. They wanted an earthly deliverer, but Christ delivers eternal life in his name. Well, what are some applications for this? The Lord does not always give us what we want, but what we need. Those people wanted a king. They didn't get a king, but they got fed for that day. Paul tells us that all things work together for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. We can want many things in this world. We might want power, we might want money, we might want fame. But the Lord has already given us an abundance of his grace. We don't need those other things when we have the abundance of his grace. Because the Lord does not give us what we want always, but what we need. Secondly, we need to seek his will. Look here at Christ as an example. He was seeking a place of retirement for that day. And what did he get? He got another work assignment. Think about that in our own lives. Sometimes we need to take a step aside from the things we do, and sometimes we need to rest also. We need to rest also. To a degree so much that, that we should make do with what circumstances come our way. 
when I was growing up as a child, my mother, my mother always had two rules for vacation travel. Two rules for vacation travel. She would make me put all my clothes out on the bed, okay? And she would say, okay, we're gonna have a good trip because we're gonna take half as many clothes and twice as much money. <laughs> she was right. And secondly, she said, Gregory, and whenever she said Gregory, that meant she meant business. Okay, it wasn't Greg, it was Gregory. She said, Gregory, you're gonna remember the three C's when we travel. And yes, as a child, I traveled a great deal around this country with my parents. But you're gonna remember the three C's. You're not gonna criticize, you're not gonna compare, and you're not gonna complain. No matter where we go, no matter what hotels, motels, or lodging places we stay in, no matter what food we eat, or no matter what people look like or even talk like, we're not gonna criticize, compare, or complain. And if we remember those three C's, we will have a good trip. And she was right. The simple fact of the matter is, is that we are to work with what we have and what we are given, not things that we do not have, that we do not have. John Calvin says, we're taught by example that sometimes we plan things, we plan things, and we think we know how things are gonna go. But God is the funniest guy of all, if you think about it. The best laid plans of men. How many times have you made a plan and then somehow God thwarted that plan? Why? Because God knew best. He knew best. Only in our minds, we thought we were doing what was right. But no. How often sometimes when you get upset when things don't go your way? Or have you considered that maybe God's plans may not be your way or my way? In being upset, things don't go your way. Are you upset with God? God tells us very clearly, right in the book of Isaiah, he tells us in Isaiah 55, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Yes, friends, God's ways are not always our ways. And finally, finally we can take away from this, to trust in the Lord's plans. Have you ever been in a desperate situation, unable to find a way out of it, you fret and you worry, and, and then you look back at it days later, maybe years later, and you found that some way God provided a way out that you did not know existed. And things never seemed as bad as you thought they would be. Did God not have a better plan for our lives? I do believe. Does he not bring you through all of your troubles? Yes, I do believe he does. God will shatter our little pint-sized explanations of things. And so when Christians are willing to offer their lives sacrificially, I think God is going to use the gifts that he has given us. The gifts he has given us. God uses people today in the same way. If you think about it, in the same way. If you think about things we can do, we can trust in the Lord. Remember that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? Or 6 and 7, excuse me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct our paths. If we pray about our past, somehow God blesses them. But if we try to take our past and then come back to God and say, well, why is it not working now? Maybe God's trying to tell us something. And finally, Philippians tells us, Paul tells us in Philippians, he tells us not to be anxious, not to worry about anything, but by prayer, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Yeah, trust in Jesus, my friends, who alone feeds them. Finally, let me end this with the fact that I said this term, the title of this sermon is called You Give Them Something to Eat. You Give Them Something to Eat. When I was a member of Baltimore Presbytery and a pastor of a church there for four years, I was the hunger action enabler for Baltimore Presbytery. And what that involved was coordinating of the 72 member, we have 72 churches in that presbytery. It went all the way from the Pennsylvania line to, to the James River in Virginia, all the way over to the eastern shore of Maryland, to the mountains of West Virginia. So we had a large presbytery with 72 churches. And I coordinated the feeding programs of all of those churches, whether it was food cupboards, whether it was food banks, whether it was food collection, whether it was feeding programs, whether it was two cents a meal, all of us to take to work together for the common purpose of giving people something to eat. Now, 
Did we feed 5,000 people? Oh yeah, we did. We fed 5,000 and a lot more. But no one person did it. No one person did it. No one church did it. It was a collective effort of all of those churches. And one time I preached a sermon about how each church can be involved in that ministry. I said, collectively, we can do more than one could do. And I made the point that back then it was very popular. You may have remembered those bracelets that said WWJD. Remember that? What would Jesus do? WWJD. I said, sisters and brothers, rather than WWJD, make it DWJD. Rather than asking what would Jesus do, do what Jesus did. DWJD. Jesus fed 5,000. We can feed more. And how can we do it? Well, I'll tell you how we can do it. We can't multiply fishes and loaves of bread. But we must not only be hearers, but doers of the word. Faith without works, James tells us, is dead. But together we can do it in a very practical way. Together we can fill those bags out there for manna hats. Not one of us can feed 5,000, but 30 of us can fill those bags with those items, and we can do a lot of good toward feeding people in this community. Yes, we can feed 5,000 or more if we put our hearts and minds to it. That, my friends, is a miracle in itself. That is us giving people something to eat. So my friends, I close with, let's fill those bags. Fill those bags, bring them in here, set them around the altar. We will bless them and we will use that to God's glory to help feed the hungry people in this community. Yes, Jesus gave people something to eat and it was a miracle. And yes, my friends, you and I can do the exact same thing. To God be the glory, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here with our worship now, we present our gifts to our Heavenly Father through our offering. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of everything. I pray now that God will open our hands and open our hearts as we return a portion of our tithes and offerings and all that He has given us. Amen.
Worship where we pray the prayers of the people. We celebrate our joys and our concerns. That phone message back, that was that a joy? Would you like to announce that joy? Give us that protection now, Lord, that 
that we can maintain and sustain the Christian law that you have given each and every one of us. Father, united as a family in prayer and as the body of Christ, we lift up these prayers to you, our creator, sustainer, redeemer, God. Hear us now as we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples, our Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Dear friends, our closing hymn is We Give Thee But Thine Own. Please stand if you're able for that closing hymn. Shepherd of the sheep, our Lord Jesus Christ himself, with all glory and dominion, power and majesty. And may that same God, through his Son, Jesus Christ, bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his favor upon you and grant you his everlasting peace this day forth and forevermore. Amen. Amen.